let's go let's go all the way back to the beginning for the people that don't know where you're from kilgore texas and maybe not even from the south or ever been there i believe your town is like closer to the louisiana border like it maybe an hour or something and then like two hours from dallas right yeah so we're we're 40 miles from the louisiana border on the we're, we're west of louisiana uh and then we're about 120 miles east of dallas um i can be in shreveport louisiana where there's a lot of stuff there it's a pretty big pretty big city you, you can go there in about an hour uh in about an hour and a half you can be in Dallas, right? maybe an hour and 40 minutes. And, and now Dallas has grown so much that it's getting closer and closer to us. I mean, just the, the small turn, the small towns around it, Terrell, everything is just getting bigger. So I like where I'm at. We're, we're away from everything, but still, uh, you can be in Tyler in 30 minutes, and, and that's a pretty big city, uh, you know, probably 100, 200,000 people, and you can get about anything you need there. Yeah, we, I, I grew up in the, the heart of the Piney Woods, East Texas, uh, and when you think of Texas, everybody thinks of, I mean, what you see in the Westerns, you know, West Texas or South Texas, and, and flat ground and cactus and tumbleweeds. and. It could not be any more different than that. It, there's more rolling hills. Uh, it's there's there's big hardwood trees. It's there's uh, a little bit a little bit south of me uh, it is really the piney wood where everything there is a pine tree. It's it's very lush. It's very green. Completely different than, than what you think. I, it, it, of all the places that we go, the most similar place would be maybe like Charlotte, North Carolina or something. I mean, a really beautiful part of Texas. I, I enjoy it. Uh, the other parts of Texas, the, the flat parts, West Texas, South Texas, I love that as well. But those, that's that's the kind of places that you either love or you don't. Close to Shreveport, close to Dallas, close to Tyler, close to Houston. Uh, I can be at, at any of them within a couple hours, two or three hours. You can be in in any of those cities. You know, I know I know the area a little bit, not necessarily your town. I was in the army back in the mid '80s, and my last duty station was Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is Leesville. So I drove up through the towns of Shreveport and obviously south to Baton Rouge, New Orleans. I did make a, a couple trips while I was there to Texas, so I went to Houston many times because that was actually closer than Dallas and then I went to Dallas as well I didn't go there a lot but I went to, I went to Dallas to see where Kennedy was shot I took that drive along Elm Street down by the book depository and under the overpass right. and, and I remember we went west to um, there was like a safari like zoo where you could be out with the animals and they walk up to your car I'm not familiar with that. I'm sure it's still there. Now with the with with the way things are, there's people all over the state that have their own zoo. You know, you can get you can buy exotic animals, you can have them on 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 your ranch or whatever. So things things in that area have changed so drastically. But yeah, I, I'm not familiar with with the one you're talking about, but it doesn't surprise me at all. And you know, I asked this, this is totally away from drag racing and everything, but you know, being in Texas when you were a little boy, when I was a boy, I grew up in Seattle, actually north of Seattle. So I grew up, even though I live in New York now, I'm really a Seattle boy. You know, we had a lot of woods and stuff. So I would go out as a kid and I'd pick up, believe it or not, I'd pick up spiders and put them in jars and snakes and frogs and everything because a lot of woods. What was it like in Texas? Because you guys got like, you could have scorpions and bees and all kinds of... Talk, talk about the, the growing up in Texas, the environment. Actually, I've been on some hunting trips in the ok Okanagan Valley. I don't know if that was close to where you were at or, or what, but yeah, that's a beautiful area there. A lot of apple orchards and a lot of a lot of stuff right there. No, man, growing up in Texas, I mean, my parents have always had a little bit of land, able to go and play in the woods and, and build forts and run around and, and catch snakes, catch spiders catch everything you know turn them loose in your buddy's mailbox uh just all kinds of terrible stuff that you probably should go to jail for today but I just, I just grew up in the country i mean you come home you don't use the telephone you yell across the street to your neighbors and get on your bicycle and you meet up at the at the corner of the road and everybody goes and rides and and as you get older you may ride an atv or a dirt bike and 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 just grow up the way i think kids should grow up you know i think now I had a, like, I remember having a video game, but it was like the original Nintendo, like the first one ever. And that's yeah. the only one that I will play to this day. Like a few years ago for Christmas, my wife bought me the original Nintendo. 
with Mario. And like, that's the only video game that you're gonna catch me playing. It just molded me as a person. I'm, I'm an outdoorsman. I love to be outside. I love to go play. And the worst days were when it was too wet or too rainy to go outside, you know, and you had to stay inside. I, like, I've, I've always been the kid that made, that had the, had the mud fights or built tree forts or whatever you do, chop trees down with an ax and build stuff. And so, you know, I've, I've got a nine month old little girl right now and I can't think of anywhere else that I would want her to grow up other than doing the things that I've been able to do. And just when you leave in the morning and you may come in and eat something for lunch or you may not, you come in from playing at dark, you know, and your parents know where you're at, just a different time. I, I agree with you and uh, I think it's such a better way of growing up than <clears throat> being stuck behind a computer or, or a bunch of video games. I mean, I remember as a kid, and these things just came to my mind now, they're not written down or anything, but I remember we were in a housing development and when they started putting in the new homes, some of my friends and I, I remember going inside those as they're building them and like the guys wouldn't be there but we would see all the nails and the hammers and they'd have open walls and insulation. I, I remember we used to jump off the roof of the house. We would actually <laughs> yeah. go up on the roof and jump off. I mean, that's crazy. If you think about that now, you'll never see kids doing that. We, we did insane stuff. As I got older and we were up in, you know, in our teens, my dad had, had already started Capco. And so occasionally we would have a track hoe or an excavator or something over at the house doing some kind of work or something, or, you know, back on the land or whatever. Well, I remember I could, I've always been around the heavy equipment and vehicles and driven and operated those and, and learned, well, we have a big pond behind our house. And I remember me and my buddies would pick each other up in the, in the excavator bucket and then jump out. You may be 20 foot in the air, <laughs> you know, but you would jump out and land in the water and maybe sling. I mean, things that are highly unsafe, but I mean, they made us who we are today. That's right. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think every kid needs to be bumped, bruised, scraped and, and just toughen up a little bit. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's fun. What was a future NHRA top fuel champion like in high school? What was, did you, I know Texas is a big football state, obviously. Did you play ball like that or you know, describe what you were like in high school. Man, have you seen me? I'm five foot seven, 150 <laughs> pounds. Have you seen the rest of the people from Texas? Man, I played I played football in the eighth grade and the ninth grade. I've always been a pretty fast runner. I've been athletic, but man, that just isn't my sport. The guys are so much bigger. And, and I mean, you know, I wanted to do it so bad, but I just, you're going up against guys that are six foot tall, 250 pounds, and they're like, they're, I don't stand a chance. I mean, I can run, I can only run fast for so long and then eventually they're going to get me. Yeah. Uh, I competed from the time I was seven till about 17. I competed in, in Taekwondo martial art, more so up in, you know, into my early teens, traveled all over the United States, raced motocross when I was, when I was young with my dad. I mean, our, my dad's 25 years older than me. I'm an old dad. I'm 38 with just having my first, first child, but I'm probably going to be a better parent because of it, just because I'm a little more mature. I, I really enjoyed the time that I got to spend with my dad, him being young and, and growing up somewhat together you know, and, and doing fun things together. You know, high school, I was, I mean, I've always kind of been the smaller kid, but I've always been the guy that everyone knew that I raced. I raced with my parents. Uh, and then when I was 15, I got my super comp license and started started traveling and, and racing with them. And so I enjoyed high school. I had some really good friends, probably a little bit shy, shy and insecure and, and just, stayed to myself. I, I knew a lot of people, but I, I never really got close to a lot of folks. I still have the same pretty small group of friends that I had then. I had to learn to be more outgoing. I had to be just more outgoing. I mean, that's something I learned through drag racing and through uh, meeting people and in, in, in business here at Capco. I, I feel old now, but I had so much fun and probably would be a different person if I had a chance to go back and be in high school again. But I see so many people all the time now. Because I mean, Kilgore's 12,000 folks. So it's not like a, a real big town here. 
and I see the guys and girls that I went to school with, you you always remember them for what they were in school, but then it's it's so cool to see what what they are now. Everybody does it, but nobody really talks about it, you know, and you just think, man, I remember me and this guy doing this or me and this girl going here or, or whatever. And then now we're 21 years out of high school. I mean, I've been out of high school longer than more than half my life. You cherish those memories a lot more looking back on them than you did at the time. I just was trying to get through it and get out of it. And now I'm like, man, there was a lot of fun that I had in, in those days uh, and made a lot of good friends. See, that that's great, you know, because when I look at my high school years, and not that it's uh, I was a, obviously a drag racer or anything, but in relation to what you were saying as far as the people being bigger than you, I was always very athletic and as a kid. I played soccer. I was very good at soccer. I was a team captain. Uh, my, my teammates nominated me team captain, which was not more, not that much different than being in my family because I'm the oldest of nine kids. I got five brothers and three sisters. I was always used to kind of being, you know, in charge of or the leader of a group. And now, and now I'm that way as a film director. When I make my movies, I'm in charge of a whole crew and the actors. And but I remember back in high school, I remember not. I wasn't so good in football. I, I was a smaller guy, 158 pounds, I believe, in senior year. I was 5'11", so I was a little taller, but I was skinnier. I played baseball, I played basketball a little bit. And I remember thinking, do I think I could be a professional athlete? Like I asked myself, do I think I could be a professional athlete? And I thought about it and I'm like, I'm not even a star in my own town. <laughs> so how am I ever gonna make it more than that? So I actually made a conscious choice. What do I wanna do with the rest of my life? And after I saw John Carpenter's Halloween and. 78 as a 13 year old boy. And then I saw The Fiend in 82, which was the same director. I said, I want to be a film director because I think I could be better than that than I could be in sports. Even though I love sports and I still work out and stuff now. That's what my story is. And, and I don't know about you, but it sounds like, you know, from what I've read and heard, you're a pretty locked in guy. And I locked in on film. So like in my high school years, I hate to admit this, but I never went on a prom or anything like that because I was so focused on learning how to become a director. I just dedicated my whole life ever since that time. And like, I'm a guy now that if you talk about a movie or the history of horror films or whatever movies, I don't need a computer to talk about it. I memorized who directed this, who shot this movie, who starred, where they shot this movie, you know, Toby Hooper shot Texas Chainsaw outside Austin, Texas, you know, so I became like an encyclopedia. Were you like that with drag racing? Yeah in a way um not so much the history of it but just studying how things work what they what what they do at the level that i was at to be honest with you i never could have imagined that i would be in the position that i am right now i mean this has been a lifelong dream race a top fuel car or drive a top fuel car much less win a race win a championship win four championships i, I could have never dreamed that We've been so blessed and fortunate to to have the business that we do and, and be able to fund and support the race team. Ultimately, my dad was a pipeline welder. All the, I've had two jobs in my whole life, work at Capco and, and lay pipelines and drive the top fuel car. And driving the top fuel car has not paid well ever. <laughs> So um, I ultimately, my, I mean, I've always wanted to, to be in this business, be in the pipeline industry and follow in what my dad has done. And, and I watched him be a welder, be a foreman for a company, be a superintendent for a company, start his own company and build everything that we have. He built Capco and he started Capco in April of 1995 or March of 95. We're, we're 27 years into this, the, the way that it has gone, the success that, that he's had and we've had as a family and, and what, what, what we have here, what Capco is, the people make it. That's all I ever really wanted to do. Then my passion has been racing and to have those opportunities, to have those chances has really put things into perspective because I know what it takes to be there. I know what it takes to run it. I know what it takes know everything about the business side of the racing. It, it makes you realize how difficult it really is uh, to have that. 
and we're fortunate because we sell funded. Uh, if if I was out there having to to rely on sponsorships and and worry about obligations to sponsors and things that you got to do to keep them happy and and do that because that then becomes your job, uh, I wouldn't be able to do it because I need to be here at work. I need to be here day to day. Uh, I, I work Monday through Friday of every week. Uh, some weeks when we have to fly out, maybe on a Thursday, I'll miss a Friday, but most of the time. We work Monday through Friday. Friday mornings, I'll come in, and, and then we head out and go to the race. Uh, the last two years, we've only raced three qualifying sessions. That one would be Friday evening. That would give us time to fly to the racetrack, get there, make the run, and then we leave Sunday night after the race is over and get back home and be at work on Monday. We're, we're not a real big company, but we're not a small company. We have about 400 employees. Everybody does a great job here. They, they're they really self-sufficient, self-motivated, self-initiative, everything, and they take good care of it. But you just need to be here, and, and people will respect you a lot more when you're here instead of off playing and, and thinking that you just don't care and, and leave, you know, leave them in charge of everything. I mean, you, you need to be back and support. And, and that's what we do. And, I, and my dad's instilled that into me my whole life. I think I probably went way off of, of what you asked me as far as, as being focused and locked in on being a professional drag racer. It, it just kind of happened. It didn't, it wasn't something that I ever truly imagined to be real. It, it takes so much to be here. People don't know. I mean, I grew up in a trailer house with very humble beginnings. There was a point in, in my parents' life when they didn't have a house. They lived in, I don't know if you guys saw the, the welding truck that we restored for my dad in 2020. It was a 1980 Chevrolet one-ton welding truck. It was the first welding truck my dad ever had. And I found the original truck with the bed <clears throat> and we restored that. And, you know, I brought it to him and my dad's not really an emotional guy at all. I've seen it change since I've had my little girl. Uh, he's a little more emotional. He, he looks at me and he goes, at one time, this is all I had. This was my house. This was like, this is all your mom and I had was this. To see that one truck and then see where we're at now and, and the hard work and everything that it's taken to get there, you don't imagine it. And, and you don't take it for granted. Work hard and plug along. And sometimes you look up and you're in a whole different area than what you thought you'd be. Was there an event or something that you saw in person that got you to want to drag race? Like what what made you want to get into even the small beginnings of the sport? Like what did you see or what did you hear, watch on TV, or did you go to a race in person? Uh, man, I was probably five or six years old. I went to Texas Motorplex. Billy Meyer, the facility was was basically new. Been around racing all my life. My dad had a street car. We would go to the local track and, and, and bracket race, you know, that night uh, on a Friday night or whatever, street car night. Then he, he, he drove a guy's dragster or, or, or drove a guy's door car. And I've, I've been through the progression of all of that. And, and so then you go to your first national event, the big race, and you see the top fuel cars. And I've never taken any, I mean, I, the, it's the same experience I had, but I've never taken anybody to the drag races to see the top fuel cars that weren't blown away. And even if you've seen it on television, it's it's not the same. And when you're there to <clears throat> tell everyone, it's a sensory sport. You have to see it, you have to feel it, you have to hear it, you have to smell it. Everything comes together to to create that experience. And when, you, when you're there and, and you have that, there's nothing that compares to that. There, there's no way that you can not be hooked. To simplify it, it's two cars going in a straight line for a thousand feet. How cool can that be? And then when you get there and you see all that and you hear all that and the ground shakes and there's header flames 12 foot in the air and the nitro's burning your eyes and you see something that is the quickest accelerating vehicle in the world. Now it's it's so much different than two cars going in a straight line. I, I completely agree with you. To add to your story, this past September at Maple Grove, I took my friend Mike because that's the closest track now that English Town is not running. So I took my friend there. I'd never been there before this year, believe it or not, or last year. So I take my friend Mike Pope, who's been a friend of mine since the late 80s. He is a guy that is known to fall asleep anywhere. I'm talking about you could be watching TV. All of a sudden he's snoring. 
a movie, you're driving, he falls asleep everywhere. So I made a bet with my wife. I said, I will take you out to dinner if he falls asleep at a drag race. And she goes, you're on. So I took him to the race. We went to the Maple Grove. Do you know that not only did he not fall asleep, and this shock, this kind of shocked me. He's a little bit older than me. He's about five years older, and he's a little bit bigger, you know, stomach and this and that. He, he gets up halfway through the race, maybe after the first round. So we're talking one o'clock, gets off the chair. We had seats right behind the starting line and he got went down to the fence and he stood there almost the rest of the day. Drag, think about that. Drag racing drew him in, not to get away from it, but to get closer. He yeah. did not fall asleep. He was wide awake. And he <laughs> told me, he told me I had a great time at the races. Yeah. And, and so you know, I, I, I was explaining all that, but I remember going and you see John Force, Kenny Bernstein, Joe Amato, Eddie Hill, all of those guys. And you and I got to meet them and I got to get an autograph. And I and, and today I have those hats from the early 90s that were lime green or hot pink that came from the Texas Motorplex and Joe Amato's signature. And so coolest thing to me, I know those guys. I, I can call those guys right now and call them a friend. I mean, man, I'm 38 years old. This is 32 years ago, 30 years ago that I'm meeting these people and I have photos with them then and now. It's just so surreal, you know, just to see it. But in 30 years from now, there's going to be some kid with a photo of me is doing the same thing. And that, that that's what I think is so awesome about this sport is the access to the drivers, the access to the crew. And you never know who's going to be the next champ. And to add to that, Steve, I, you know, I grew up, my father who, no longer live, you see his phone right there. Um, his name is Reed A. Wickham. He was a drag racing fanatic his whole life, not just as a fan, but my dad was similar, I guess, to your dad. He was a welder and he put together engines his whole life. He was the best mechanic I've ever known personally. He used to run, when I was growing up, he had a 39 Chevy with a 392 Hemi. It was yellow with pearl flames. He took off the front fenders, so it was open to the engine. And at that time, back in the 70s, mid 70s, early 80s, he ran fuel altered class, mm -hmm. which of course is outlawed now. He was running like maybe 160 miles an hour back then at that time. He was in my garage, that car was in my garage. Parachute, all his tools and welding equipment. So as a boy, he used to take me to the races, which at the time was Seattle International Raceway, SIR. Mm -hmm. which Bill, Bill Donor was the owner. And he always had those radio commercials on all the radio stations. Come and see 64 funny cars. And, you know, so as a boy, my dad took me to the races all the time. And I saw at that time, it was Don the Snake Perdome, Tom the Mongoose McEwen, Ed the Ace McCullough. You know, in the in our area, it was uh, Jerry the King Ruth. Was mm -hmm. You know, so those are just some of the folks. But my, my, my favorite, besides my dad, of course, was uh, Ed the Ace McCullough. He was always kind of the underdog, especially to the snake. And the snake was so dominant in that army funny car. You know, I don't know about you, Steve. I'd love to hear your, your, your thoughts on this. But the coolest thing I ever saw, ever, on a drag strip, I would say in the mid-70s, there was probably three or four years, they did 64 funny cars. And they would line up all the funny cars on the strip, and they'd start them at the same time, which yep. was crazy loud and shaking. The ace. The, I guess Bill Donor must have paid him extra to do this. I don't know this from back, I'm guessing. But the ace came in for a solo run, McCullough, and he was in the right lane. And his car actually, he did a full track burnout. I'm talking from the start all the way to the very end. And the crowd went freaking crazy, smoke everywhere, right? And I, I know you know Seattle, because obviously you've ran there. But you know, they've got that kind of large turnaround area down there. So mm -hmm. what the ace did was, after he made the run, or the burnout, he turned the funny car around, which kind of took a little bit to do. Kind of went like this, and he turned it around, did a full track burnout back on the other side, the left lane, and drove into the pits. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that. You know, I do know Ed, and, and, and so his son Jason worked for us uh, on my dad's car. It goes back to just like what you're saying. I mean, these are heroes for us. And then getting to know them is so awesome, man. I mean, an ace was a rough, rough character. 
I mean, Ace would punch you and, and, and just as happy as look at you. I don't know. I've, I've been down that road. It doesn't go well for you, but it, it, it's it's back in the just the good old days of drag racing where it was characters. It was Don the Snake. It was Ed the Ace. It was it was the Mongoose. You know, I think we lack some of that today. I think that we lack some of those characters. And, and man, I get it. Everybody has to mind their P's and Q's and dot their I's and cross their T's and everything's corporate, but not always do people want to see that. People want to see real people. Yes, it's a professional sport, but there's emotions. There's emotions that go into it. And, and, and let me tell you, I have a lot of friends in the Western industry, saddleback, bareback, bull riders. That's probably the only thing that I can think of that really compares to what we do. Because that guy is, is that guy or gal saddling up and tying on or hanging on to the most adrenaline filled ride that they can come up with or think of time and time again. And they love doing it. And when they jump off, they're jacked up, they're excited, they're everything. You just rode 2,000 pounds of beef that is trying to throw you through the roof. If you think about it, I just rode. 2,300 pounds of titanium and chrome moly and aluminum and carbon fiber that is trying to send me to the moon because everything is like if you if you told me to build something that goes 330 miles an hour it would not look like a top fuel drag but we have wings keeping us down on the ground generating downforce to keep you from taking off people don't realize a top fuel car is going over 100 miles an hour in 60 feet. And so to put that into perspective, when you're at the red light and you're standing or you're parked beside a semi-truck and trailer, almost all semi-trailers are 53 foot. We're, a, a top fuel car is going over 100 miles an hour in, the, in a shorter distance than the front of that truck to the back of that trailer. And so when you put that into perspective, people are like, man, you know, no way. I tell people all the time at the ropes, all the race trailers are 56. From the back of this trailer to the back of that truck, like to the back of the cab, is 100 miles an hour. No way. I said, yes. And it does it in eight tenths of a second. I've ventured way off here, but it's the most adrenaline field thing that I can think of. And then you jump out of the, at the end, and you're not going to be correct on everything you say because you just rode a missile throw competition into the mix where you're trying to beat someone beside you and especially if it's a pedal fest or if it's a whole shot win or whatever it is or vice versa it's it, i mean it's the highest of the high when it's a pedal fest or a whole shot win and the lowest of the low when it's a pedal fest or a whole shot loss you know because everyone there is so deadly and trying so hard and then it, and, and it can come down to thousands of a second it's difficult to hop out of that car and be the the most calm either direction of neutral emotion whatever it is people tell me oh man i would do it and and i can tell you most people wouldn't because when you crank that car up and that thing's sitting there and it's shaking and vibrating and, and like your your vision is blurred because the car's shaking so hard if you touch the roll cage with, with your helmet or if you lean your head against the back, it, it, the vibration blurs your vision. You know, m most of those people say, oh, I would do it. They would change their mind when the, when the engine started. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 don't mean, and I don't mean to be negative in any way, but it, and I'm going off my notes that I had typed up, but you, you said something that makes sense to me and I think it can actually be spun in a way that to the credit to you. And in regards to that, I remember you had a race a couple years back. I believe it might have been in Pomona and you were racing Cameron <laughs> Ferrer and you lost the race that, that particular round against him. And I remember you went over and obviously like you're saying, your emotions are running high. There's a lot at stake. We and won the, I, we, we won the round. Oh, you won the round. Oh, but you, but you were upset and he held you down or he made you wait or right. something. Right. Okay. So my 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 apologies. So so talk about that and let me know how did that change? Did that change you in any way after that situation? Because it seems like it did. And I don't mean to be negative in any way with you. No, 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 not at all. Um, yeah, it did. It, it, going back to what I said, I mean, emotions are, are high. That round right there, 
one of the deciding factors in the, cha in the championship. You know, looking back on it, I know the situation that Cameron was in. I know the situation that I was in. Cameron's going there to try to win the round uh, and do the best he can. At that, at that time, I mean, there's a lot at stake for me. I'm trying to win the round, win the championship. I'm looking at it from my perspective. Well, this, this guy doesn't race a full schedule. This guy needs to go up here and just race not try to play any games, not try to do anything. There's, there's really, at, at the way I was thinking, what has he got to gain by playing these games and, and, and whatever? W what he has to gain is he can win the round, win, potentially win the race or whatever. And if he, takes, if he takes us out, I mean, great. You know, I, I just was looking at that completely wrong. And I didn't want him to lay down or I didn't want him to do anything, but I just felt that that was the wrong place at the wrong time to anything out of the norm but what he did was was very well within the rules uh you got to look back I, I i i raced a guy years and years ago named steve fetterland that was one of the greatest top alcohol dragster racers ever i went up and, and i raced him and he was racing a blown car and i was racing an injected car and top alcohol dragster and and there's a difference in staging procedures he revved the motor up that that kind of gave me the signal to pull the high side in the injected car and roll in and, and stage. Well, then he let the engine back down. And it's just, it completely messed up my train of thought and my focus and everything. And he goes in and beats me on a whole shot. And I get out and I'm, I'm like 23, 24 years old. And I'm like, I'm highly irritated, but I'm like, I don't, I don't even, I didn't even know what to do. It just, it ruined me. He, he come over. I don't remember exactly what he said. But I, I thought about it for three or four races. I just kept thinking and, and thinking. Eventually, we race each other again somewhere else. I go in, and, in, and, and instead of doing the courteous thing where, where you know, we, 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 to be in the same scenario, I just rolled in and turned both bulbs on and made him hurry up. <laughs> and, I, and I beat him. And I get out of the car at the end. And, and I, I mean, I'm Steve Federland's six three or four or five. He was a great big tall guy. He come over and he goes, you little, and he had some stuff to say. And then he's and like, I'm scared to death. And then he starts laughing and he goes, I like it because it's your job to do what you got to do to beat me. And, and, and he goes, everything was in the, within the rules. Good job. Rewind a few years ago. I forgot that Cameron and I are, are good friends. Now we talk, we don't talk a whole lot away from the racetrack. Uh, we'll stay in touch. He's got he's got a new baby, uh, about the same age as mine, and and a and a little boy. We 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 do a lot to try to help him. You know, he drove Todd Payton's car uh, a little bit this year. We we helped that team quite a bit. A great guy, and trying to get trying to get out there full time. I don't think it changed me. It just kind of refreshed my memory on some things, and 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 where where he, where he's at and where he's trying to go and you just got to do the best you can do with that being said he and i have made peace with it we've chose to go on the following day and have been good ever since people will forgive you for for everything if they want to and they won't if they don't want to and so i, I don't honestly i don't talk about that a whole lot but being that you asked me um that that's where it stands and i mean it's one of those things you, if you could change you would but you can't so you just got to deal with it own up to it and go on I, I i think it's great and again i was never going to bring it up it was not on my notes or anything but you said something that's made me remember that situation i think it's a credit to you obviously i've gone but i did think you said something that's very important and i think it's important in the movie world where i deal as a film director and i don't see this a lot in the filmmakers today Somehow there's this balance of where you're trying to be professional and courteous and friendly, but you still don't need to be so politically correct and so whitewashed that you become just like a zombie or a drone. I love that you say drag racing, missing some of that character. I see that in films. When I watch movies today and I watch the way they're directed, and I know this is kind of technical and maybe something you don't follow or whatever, but when I watch the way films are made, especially the scary movie world, there's so many people that are all the same. They don't have that unique vision. Like when I was growing up, it was John Carpenter and George Romero and Toby Hooper from Texas and you know David Cronenberg from Canada. They had their unique stamp, visually, storytelling wise. And I could certainly see how you say that with drag racing because 
it seems like our world is pushing more where everything has got to kind of be blended into the same. And I get how you shouldn't be mean to people or, you know, attack people or whatever, but you still got to be your own self. And I, I think that's really important. Even like when you look at the funny cars now, the actual funny car itself, I remember they all back, look the same. They, they all look the same. Like they call them different bodies, but back in the seventies, they all look different. You know what I'm saying? And it gave it yeah. so much more character. Well, the, the one thing with funny cars, pro stock cars, pro mod cars, and, and pro mod was by far the most unique. You might see, like you, you remember Scotty Cannon coming out with a car that was the, the big tomato. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and just all the unique body styles and shapes and crazy things that they did. But as competition steps up, one guy spends a little bit more money and goes and gets the aerodynamics all correct and runs a little bit faster. So then the next guy does it, the next guy does it. And, th and that's why you you lose that in the cars. I'm, I'm not a funny car guy. I would, I've driven them. I've never driven a fuel funny car. I've driven an alcohol funny car. By far the funnest thing I've ever driven because there's so much going on. It, it, it's It's got to where everything looks so cookie cutter because it's gotta be, it's gotta be on the cutting edge of, of going quicker and going faster. And I will be honest with you, Toyota's new super body, it makes me want to drive a funny car. The thing looks so cool. Uh, and, and you'll see some of those coming out this year. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really excited to see because I think it's going to have it. I think they'll have an advantage. I think that the thing looks that quick. It looks that fast and, and just the engineering that went in behind it. But there again, that's the that's the, the, the driving factor, how they are and how they look is is performance. A lot of people that don't know drag racing, obviously like you and the way my father brought me up around the sport, they don't realize that the crew chief or crew chiefs, could be two, three, are so important to a race. And that's not to take anything away from you. How did you, how did you get Richard Hogan as your crew chief? Because that man seems like a genius behind the controls of your car. It's unbelievable. I had raced with Dexter Tuttle, 06, 07, uh, we didn't race, 08, 09, somewhere in 10. I raced with that team and we were struggling at one point. And I, and I told Dexter, I said, you know, I'm friends with Richard Hogan and, and I think that he could come help us. Uh, and so I talked to Richard and I just, I just met him from being out there at the races. And, and Richard, uh, a lot of folks don't remember, but the year that Melanie Troxel was so dominant, I think 11, 11 finals, seven race wins, I mean, like seven finals in a row, Hogan was the crew chief. I, I've always known his capabilities, um, but he's just, he's one of these people that you really got to get to know. He's pretty quiet, he's pretty reserved, kind of stays to himself, a great guy but you got it. You, you, you support him. You put him in a, in a, in a position, you support him the best you possibly can. And he's, he's a championship caliber crew chief. He's proven that. When we started our team in 11, uh, I, I told my dad, I said, that's our guy. That's that. And he goes, well, I'm, I, you're making the call. Richard started with us. Um, I think right there in 13, we had, we had some issues. My dad made me fire Hogan for about half a season. Um, we all joke with my dad now and tell him it was the time that Hogan went on vacation. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it's, to my dad's defense, the racing industry is so much different than, than the pipeline industry. And a top fuel car is a beast of its own. Everything, you can be doing everything correct and it not go your way. Uh, as far as just it's it's there's so many variables that make a car great or not great. We learned that, and and, and we've we've been back on track. So I, I joke with Hogan. I said, "Remember that time you went on vacation?" And we just <laughs> laugh. Richard is is in addition to being first and foremost, Richard's one of my best friends, uh, and then Richard's my crew chief. I, I talk to him about the car. I talk to him about personal things. I, I mean, we, we just have a great friendship. We all do with each other on the team. Bobby Lagana doesn't get enough credit um, because he's, he's kind of like the glue that holds everybody together. He, he fills in 
every void, every spot, keeps everybody's morale good. He keeps Hogan smooth because he will tip over occasionally over some stuff that nobody knows why, uh, as will I or Billy or, or whatever. And, and it falls back to Mama Kay and Bobby keeping everybody happy. The team that, that we've assembled has been just, without a doubt, that's the reason for our success. Everybody can go buy the same parts, the same pieces. There's better drivers out there than me. There's not better teams. And, and it takes each and every one of us because there's times that, yeah, I do go save the car. I go out and, and win a race on a whole shot or, or something, but those are few and far between. The, the times that that car goes down the racetrack consistently and maybe not the quickest, but the most is intimidating. Because when you can go run 362, but you only do it one out of four passes, and we can go run 365 and we can do it four out of four, it, it's it's different, you know? And maybe not, maybe not even that quick. Maybe it's a 368, but you do it four times on race day, so that wins a lot more races than running 362 one time. What was it like when Dom had the accident? Dom Lagana, Bobby's brother. I know that must have been devastating to everyone. And um, I was, you know, as an outside fan of drag racing, it was, it kind of shook everybody up. T talk about that a little bit and, and how much has that meant to you guys that he's still there in the best way he can be now. That must have been very difficult. Man, I'll tell you, it, it just, it'll take you to your knees because Bobby and Dom are such an integral part of that race team. Uh, those guys right there have never had a job. They've only raced their whole life uh, and done so with their family. And you cannot find another person that lives and breathes drag racing like they do. Uh, Dom has won a championship in wherever, across the pond, Sweden or Finland or somewhere. He's won some championships over there. Uh, and and fly, used to fly over there quite a bit and tune cars. Bobby's been over here, but those guys are at the shop 6.30 in the morning, 8 o'clock at night, whatever it takes. They don't go home. I mean, even if there's really nothing to do, that's where they hang out. When that happened to Dom, it changed all of us. It, 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 it changed every one of us. It probably changed Bobby the most. That's his brother. That's his brother, but that's more like his son as well. Uh, Bobby's really taken Dom under his wings for, for a long time. There's seven, eight years difference in them. You could just see the pain that it put on Bob to see his brother going through what he was going through. Really, all of us thinking that we were gonna lose him. The outlook from the doctors was not good. But I'll tell you, Dom Lagana is the toughest guy I know. And I used to think I was pretty tough. I mean, I've had cancer, I've had a heart attack, I've had, you know, other issues. I mean, I've, I've had some stuff. And I thought, man, I'm pretty tough. Dom Legan is the toughest guy I know. And to see what he's gone through, how he's handled it, the attitude that he consistently maintains. And there's days that Dom doesn't have, that, that probably doesn't have the best day, but nobody sees it. Maybe his, maybe his wife, maybe his brother, maybe, but nobody else. And that's, that's a testimony to all of us to be around. I mean, and then you see, you know, that happened at, at one of the indie races that year. We had so many of them. And you show back, back up at the racetrack and everybody's got a Lagana Strong shirt on. I mean, and it's not just a few, it's everybody. It, it shows you how much of an impact those two young men have had on the entire racing industry. I take pride in, they were they were known, everybody knew who they were because of their dad and they'd come out and they, they struggled and, and, and did what it took to be there and worked so hard, but just never really had the success. And, and now they're part of our team and the success that we've all had together kind of like the diamond in the rough and you got a couple of them and now they're shining pretty solid. 
Yeah, and you know, uh, I, you know, for those who don't know, and I, I apologize to the audience or viewers out there that don't know what happened, but uh, Dom was in an accident where he lost both of his legs, right? Yeah, yeah, he lost both. Uh, in a single car accident outside of the racetrack uh, on a Sunday evening after we had won the race, uh, him, Richie Crampton, and, uh, and 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 another guy, Jake, that worked with us and um, or was on the team at the time. All of them were hurt bad. All of them were hurt really bad, and um, and and Dom hurt the most, and and lost both legs above the knee. Uh, and had some head trauma that they didn't anticipate him overcoming. And Dom remembers everything but the day. So uh, it's just a testament to the good Lord looking after him and, and pretty, pretty awesome, man. And, you know, I got to say something else, Steve, and this is, I think, really important because obviously you know this and I, I feel it too. The drag racing community, I'm not a racer, I'm just a fan. But I got to tell for the folks out there that you know, NFL, NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball. Uh, drag race is a very different animal to me. Uh, when you go to a drag race, I've gone to drag races with my father, with friends, I've gone by myself. And I have never had a bad time. And it's almost like if you go to a race, whether you're in the, before the race, where everybody's tailgating and cooking food and burgers and dogs and chicken and fish and pigs and everything else. Everybody welcomes you like you're one of them. And I, I gotta say that I've, I've never had a bad time at race. I'll sit to strangers all around me by myself. Cause if a friend doesn't want to go with, go with me, I don't care. I'm going to the race and I've had such a great time. They welcome you in with open arms, you're watching cars that are really violently explosive, but yet the way they're so safe between the safety safari and then your guys, uh, the NHRA's rules and the way you guys design these cars. I mean, people should really check it out because uh, I can say, I told people, if you've been to all those other sports, you have not experienced the most exciting sport on the planet. It's definitely drag racing. By far, and, and you know, when you go there, everybody's on a common ground everybody's there to watch the races whether you're rooting for me or you're rooting for for Brittany or, or leah or austin crock or or antron or whoever every one of us are not going to win so if one of them gets out you can root for the next guy or the next girl but it's you're really there to see the show to see the the it's entertaining it's the most violent crazy, explosive, quickest, fastest thing there is. And so you go there and, and that's common ground for everybody. Everybody is in awe of the spectacle that is happening and, and watching two cars go over 330 miles an hour. I mean, whoever it is, it's pretty cool to watch. Yeah, and I, I have one more story. I know we've been on a while now, but I have one more story in relation to the sport and my father, just to show you how good the NHRA basically family is. So two years ago in 19, my father found out he had throat cancer in May of 19. And I had not been home for like 11 years. My dad had come out in that time, but I had not gone back to Seattle in like 11 years. And I'm like, okay, as soon as I found out my dad had throat cancer, they gave him five to seven months to live. That was it. And they ended up being exactly right. And so I knew I had to go back. And my dad was such a drag racing fan his whole life and a racer himself in those classes he used to race in, that I said, I've got to take him to a race. One last time, because you know he's going. He's definitely going. So I said, I've got to do it. And what I thought about was I had gone to a race at English Town and I had wanted to get connected with Ed Ace because he was my favorite. I just wanted to talk to him. So I went over to Don Schumacher's, one of his teams, and I saw Don standing there. And for those who don't know, Don is probably like the biggest drag racing guy in, in the sport for the last 30, 40 years, with all his teams of Top Fuel and Funny Car, et cetera. So I see him standing there by himself with his red shirt with the DSR on. 
and I got his attention and he asked me to come over to him. He ended up giving me his, his, his business card and he said, reach out to me to get Ace's number. I've never talked to Ace since then, but I've tried. Anyway, so so when my dad got sick and he had five to eight months, seven to seven months, I reached out to Don Schumacher. I called him on his cell phone he gave me and said, listen, is there anything you could do to get my dad close to the track? Because he's going to die in you know a few months and he's a drag racing freak. And I would love for him to experience it one last time down there really close to the track. And he can't move very well because he was really incapacitated. So Don said to me, I want you to reach out to Pacific Raceways, talk to them and have them contact me and we will see what we can do. And let me, maybe a few weeks, a month go by. This was in May. The race in Seattle was August of that year, first week of August. So I bought my tickets for the first week of August and I was definitely going out. And Don, I got contacted by Pacific and they said, between John Schumacher and us, we are going to give four seats for your father, yourself, and your two brothers. We're going to put you right under the tower, basically on the track to watch the race for your dad. If your dad can't move around between Don and us, BSR, we're going to get you a, a motorized vehicle to transport your father. We, uh, the Schumacher Racing is going to put you in their, their VIP for food, for lunch and dinner. You don't have to pay for anything. Do you know, which I was so incredibly grateful for, do you know my dad was so sick, we could not go. Oh, man. But that's, but the story is really to show you what Schumacher and his team and Pacific Raceways and the NHR as a whole, they were reaching out to try to do something for my father. And I wanted to take him so bad, but I couldn't because he physically just couldn't. He told me, I, and that tells you how sick he was. He was a drag racing freak. In fact, do you know that after he got cremated, where he wants his ashes to go is he wants us to take him to Pacific Raceway and to, to put his ashes on the side of the track. So we haven't done it yet. My dad's still in a container. But once all the family can go, we're going to take my dad to Pacific. So anyway, I told the story because that tells you a lot about Don Schumacher, Pacific Raceways, and the NHRA. It's, they're wonderful. But it, it, it really exemplifies just the grassroots and, and the people um, that, that are in our sport. And, and you look at it, and there's still so many of the old timers in the sport. You know, you got Don, you got the ace, you got, you got Conrad over there that will, Conrad may pass away at the racetrack. And that would be the coolest thing ever is because that guy right there is the history of the sport, Connie Coletta. Uh, but to have him out there and, and just, it, it just shows you the grassroots of it and what everybody, uh, what everybody pulls together to, to, to keep it going to keep it supported. And it's a family. I mean, and that's how, that's how my whole team is as well is, is it's family. And we've met, I've met so many different young people and, and families that are going through things very, very similar to you. I met a young man. I met two young men. Both of them had cystic fibrosis uh, and, and <clears throat> have become good friends with their family. The one little boy, the younger one, he didn't make it. He uh, he passed away the following year. And then the the older brother was was very fortunate and got got a lung got lung transplants um, and and is doing great now. But you just you, you don't know who and what and how much you can impact people. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a platform. It's an opportunity to give back, to, to do, do for others that, that, you know, that you may change their life. And, and, you know, you, though you didn't get that opportunity to take your dad, it was there and, and you know that. And so, um, it gives you a different perspective and outlook on a lot of folks out there that you don't, you don't truly get to see when you see someone on television for 15 seconds at a time. Well, Steve, thank you for all the time today. Um, you are an incredible drag racer. Obviously, you're the most dominant racer out of any class I've seen over the last half decade. Obviously, that's, you know, your success is 
you know, everyone that follows drag racing knows it. For those who don't, you guys should get aboard this fast train. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a family. It's, um, it's truly the most exciting sport. And I wish you luck on the next season, on the new season, which we're three, four weeks away. Um, I can't wait to watch it. I'll be there in Maple Grove. I'd love to come and shake your hand in person. Come back, come back. That yeah, come be- by and see me, man. We'll take you in and show you around. And that's that's always a fun place. There's a there's a awesome place there called No No Albies. Uh that's a pizza place uh close to where where everybody stays. And so I gotta make a trip there and, and get some pizza and hot wings. But that's uh, that's the main thing that I look forward to on different racetracks is what what good food to go eat. <laughs> and and you know when I went to Maple Grove, the first the first pro driver that I got to in the pits was you and your dad and your dad was right out there and I'll never forget this and it, 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 it will always stay with me you guys I don't know if it was you or your dad or someone on the crew but you guys were playing Dio I think it was We Rock and I'm a heavy metal guy my whole life yep. and as soon as I heard that I said that's freaking awesome and <laughs> so, so it just like juiced me up the day was beautiful you could smell the nitro in the air but uh, Steve, you, could, you know, thank you for coming on my show. I hope you had a good time. I had a great time. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And uh, I look forward to seeing it at Maple Grove. Okay, be safe, Steve.